Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm very excited today. One of my favourite albums of all time is, of course, Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds. And I think if you're in my age group and you're British in particular, you probably heard it thousands and thousands of times. It was, for a boy growing up in England in the late 70s and the early 80s, everybody I knew had that album. And it's one of, it's an absolute masterpiece. So this is very, very exciting for me because I get to talk to the man himself, Mr. Jeff Wayne. How the devil are you? Uh, I am just very well, thank you. And it's a pleasure to be talking with you. Um, and thanks for those lovely words. Uh, uh, very much appreciated. So give me, you, we, we spoke a little bit off camera, so I've got a little bit of details on you. You came to England, to the UK, when you were nine with your parents because your dad was, a, was an actor? He was an actor, a singer. Uh, he did uh, probably all the media going in those days. He had several number one uh, singles in the United States, uh, did Broadway, toured. He had an act, as they were called in those days, traveled like all musicians, you know, traveled around the country doing all the gigs that were on offer to him and a lot of radio shows. Sorry, I'm just reliving in my mind things that I know about him, uh, pictures that I've seen of him. He, he entertained the troops for some years during the Second World War. Yeah, he pretty much covered the bases. He was a very good songwriter. He had a, a lot of his songs were recorded by artists of the day that you'd know. And uh, he had a coast to coast radio show named the Jerry Wayne Show, which was Jerry was his first name. And I have cuttings of him with his guest artists that were some of the biggest names of the day in mostly music. A couple were in other you know areas of the industry but i never knew a lot of my dad until somebody who was actually doing some research for me on a project started to check out my dad he said are, are you aware of what your dad achieved and i said well i know some of it for sure maybe all of it he said no no i bet you don't because you've never mentioned him in this context and suddenly this huge outpouring uh of his career came about and uh, i'm about three quarters of the way through an autobiography, uh, uh, which has a lot of his achievements. But he got caught in the um, period when the senator, Joseph McCarthy, created with the shame, I think, or with shame, uh, McCarthyism and the blacklistings. So his career suddenly ended around 1951. He went on the folk circuit because he was always into folk music, toured with a lot of the, the major artists of the day. And that got him through, so to speak, the last couple of years before we moved to England, when my dad got Guys and Dolls. The, the folk period was really a very great period of songwriting, storytelling yes. of American history. So he loved all that. That's absolutely incredible. Probably the McCarthyism sort of played into the the geographic, the moving to the UK to you know establish himself as a as a star over there. You're saying he came over to do Guys and Dolls? Yeah, he uh, he was fortunate that the producers they had cast him in the same role when Guys and Dolls first opened on Broadway, which from memory was around <clears throat> 1948. And incredible. Uh, yeah, but he had a bad luck in that it was a combination of playing too much tennis, which wore out his back, and then falling on stage on an entrance to a musical that was touring the U.S., and he fell, and he needed back surgery in that period of time. Six months in rehab and on your back was pretty commonplace. So he mm -hmm. lost the Broadway version of Guys and Dolls, but when it did come to the U.K., with the probably the entire, or all but... Uh, the entire Broadway cast that the producers brought over, but they put my bat, my dad back in the role that he was first signed to do. Incredible. And they couldn't, and they couldn't have cared less about Joseph McCarthy. Oh God, no! <laughs> thank, thank the, thank the stars for that one. That's absolutely wonderful. So you're nine years old when you first come to the UK. I'm just thinking of uh, you're growing up around music and musicals. 
Did you have music lessons? Was your father teaching you stuff or was it just all osmosis? You were just absorbing it. Well, I was absorbing a lot because my dad, probably the majority of his friends were either from within the entertainment industry and not just performers, but writers, directors, as well as tennis players. Cause he was, uh, he played number one for Ohio state university and played throughout his life. So those were two big influences on me, just naturally, so to speak. You know, as life moved on and we came to England, there was a lot of other work that my dad did that, uh, again, I met some fantastically talented people and some pretty good tennis players. Now I'm intrigued to see who the tennis players were. (laughs) There there were some men that he played against, but there was a lady that stood out because he he became a hitting partner um, at the Queen's Club in England, which to, I remain a member of due to my dad. Uh, it's one of the great racket clubs in the world, for sure. But uh, I don't know if the name Althea Gibson means anything. She was a pretty pretty darn good player as a lady, won major titles, Wimbledon, the U.S. Open, uh, French Open, singles, doubles. My dad was introduced to her at Queen's Club because – particularly in those days, good players had a tough time finding other good players to become hitting partners. Althea was introduced to him by another uh, number one lady named, uh, uh, well, actually, she was not only number one in Great Britain, but she, she won titles too. But she introduced my dad to Althea. And they became good friends. And in exchange for Althea hitting with my dad, he taught her how to sing because what she wanted to do was to get out of tennis and to become a singer and do live entertainment. Uh, Angela Buxton, by the way, is the name of the other lady, a lovely lady who we we as a family stayed very much in touch with her until she passed away just a couple of years ago. Incredible. I have a lot of affinity with that. My my mother was a ball girl at uh, Wimbledon and oh, wow. when she okay. was really super young. And when I... When I grew up, I remember opening like a cupboard and it was full of tennis balls, like hundreds and hundreds of tennis balls. And I was like, where'd you get these from? And she said, well, after X number of games or whatever, you know, even though they were like brand new, they would just get rid of them because they had to be the freshest balls. And so we had hundreds of these tennis balls that were just given away at the end. Yeah, pretty amazing. Yeah, no, that, that's a tradition in the major tournaments for yep. sure. And I think it's after... The first seven games, yep. you replace them with a new. In those days, I'm not even sure they were pressurized cans, but certainly whatever form they came in, you replace the can, whatever the the, the balls with a new set, and then it went from seven to nine games thereafter in that match. They were all gray. I remember they were all gray. They weren't like the modern, you know, oh. kind of greeny yellow color. So I imagine it's probably a little bit more difficult to see. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, considering how bright they are now. Yeah, but yeah, we had hundreds of them. And so that's when I was like, Mom, how do you have these? And then she's like, well, I was a ball girl at Wimbledon when I was, I don't remember, 13 or something, very young. And that would have been a big honor to whoever became a ball girl, ball, a ball boy, still is. Yep. You know, it's the traditions. And did she play tennis as well? Yeah, she she was good. I I wasn't. (laughs) I think your your, your family sounds like they were blessed with two genes, with the musical and the sporting. My father was a a painter and also good at sports. I I just got the music side. I didn't. (laughs) That's good enough. One out of two ain't bad. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm traditional sort of, I played cricket and rugby. I didn't play didn't play football and sorry soccer for the Americans or tennis that, that, that evaded me but so I did play soccer football from the first school that I I went to and I was the, the position was I think didn't last many years after that uh, I was playing the uh, position of outside left it's now called something else presumably uh, a winger if it's on the outside on the left uh, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. might have been and uh, yeah. He was also catcher for the same school in cricket, but I, I was a good batsman as well. I played a good standard of baseball in the years that I lived there in the, in the Little League, uh, which is a famous baseball league all around the United States for 
young boys, I think, between... My son played for a little bit in the Little League. Yeah, I, I forget the age group, but for the younger guys... Super young, like yeah. That. You said that at 13 you went back to the U.S., yeah. What was your sort of musical education at this point? Because you said earlier off camera that you didn't actually ever study music formally. Well, not formally, but piano I did uh, from the age of about five. And I did take lessons for something like 16 years. I started in New York and it was traditional piano lessons. And then we moved to England, as you've now learned. I studied with a classical uh, teacher and stayed with that for the four years we first lived in England. And then when I came back to New York with my parents, I was getting into jazz and took jazz piano with a teacher who was a very well-known pianist in his own day. And like many musicians, he taught uh, at Juilliard School of Music. And I always remember his name is John Mahegan, who had many highly regarded books about jazz. And I took with him for about a year and a half. The story that I remember most is that he taught a very young Burt Bacharach, very young, but young enough to have smoked a joint with him. Uh, <laughs> and he said that was the best that he got out of Burt Bacharach. Well, <laughs> I, have a, I have a feeling Burt Bacharach got a lot more out of him because what a genius he turned into. Absolutely. Now, you said you came back to England at around 19 years old to compose or score a musical for your father? Yeah, it was uh, turned into a West End musical at the Palace Theatre Cambridge Circus, where many, many great musicals have played, including Les Mis, which I mention as one only because the musical my, my dad was producing, he had been following some of my songwriting. We wrote some songs together. I put it down to nepotism, 100%, <laughs> because he could have hired any top flight composer to write for a West End musical. But for some crazy reason, uh, he w wanted me. And I kept saying to him, Dad, you can get a lot better. He said, no, I'm, I'm watching and listening to some of your material. We wrote a couple of songs together as well. And he wanted to write the lyrics for this musical. It was called Two Cities, written by Charles Dickens, based upon, it was sort of like the English version of what Les Mis was, in France, very, when I look back now all these years, it really was a flip side. I couldn't talk him out of hiring somebody else. And so I came back came back to England and we did the musical. And uh, uh, it was a wonderful experience for me. Instead of going back, as I promised, many of my tennis pupils, because I taught tennis, it helped pay my way through college teaching tennis, because I had no expectation of lasting very long in England uh, after this musical opened and an expectancy of nothing. Uh, I kept telling them, look, I'll, I'll only be a three months, six months maximum. Don't get another tennis teacher. I'll be back. Uh, <laughs> and I think they're still waiting because I've never returned. Uh, and the musical was really a big stepping stone for me by pure fortune, good fortune. Uh, and I started getting a lot of media work, which led to other things and eventually some of the bigger projects that I've been fortunate to get involved with. Uh, what year was that? Well, that would have been around 19, what, uh, two cities you're talking about. Yes, two cities, yes. Yeah, yes. that was 1969 that it opened at the Palace Theatre. That's incredible. Yeah, it, it was for me. Absolutely but you incredible. About, you mentioned about me composing and or scoring. I did compose all the score. But I uh, uh, composed, but I scored uh, all the dance music, which was probably one of the great bits of fun that I had because there was an American choreographer named Jaime Rogers who was in West Side Story, both in New York and then when it became a movie. And then he went on to become a very well established choreographer, including Elvis Presley in Vegas and. And, and a lot of other things. And my dad found him uh, to be interested and came over. And we actually hung out a lot together in uh, a much greater form than Bert Bacharach did with John Mahegan, if I can express it that way. <laughs> you can. You can indeed. Leading up 
to War of the Worlds. Presumably you're super busy. I mean, you've, you've got a, a, a wonderful musical playing in the West End, which must be a dream come true, uh, of a Charles Dickens classic, which, you know, growing up in the UK and you know from being in the UK is like quite hallowed to say the least. Um, Dickens is one of the most important writers we've ever had. I mean, a person that helped... I probably probably for a lot of Americans watching this, they, they they won't understand. Dickens' works were used in the Houses of Parliament to illustrate social change that needed to happen in the country. That's how important Dickens was. These books weren't just sort of fly by night fun books about poverty. They literally showcased just how poor most of Britain was in, during some of the wealthiest times. And he's still held up there with, with Shakespeare for, for British wow. people. Well, you know, that is a fact I didn't know. I did know that some of his uh, early works first appeared in episodic, as an episodic adventure in you know monthly publications that would come out, which coincidentally is how The War of the Worlds was first published. So what's the, what's the leap? How do you, I mean, there's so much to talk about uh, with, with War of the Worlds, but it's H.G. Wells' classic. Was it something you had grown up with as a, as a child? Uh, I remember in New York at around the age of seven, eight, nine, seeing a film version of it that was made in 1953, which was the year, in fact, that we first moved to England. So I probably became aware of it in England, not in New York, come to think of it. Uh, but it was a modernized version of H.G. Wells' story, and it really didn't have the, the depth. I mean, it was a good movie with the special effects. Everybody did their roles just dandy, dandily, dandy, uh, very That's well. Good. <laughs> it just didn't have what I fell in love with, which was a very dark Victorian tale. And when I finally read it, my dad actually handed it to me because he knew I was keen to interpret a story. It didn't have to be the War of the Worlds. It was just something that I fell in love with for whatever the reason. But it, it was after a lot of reading of other books that I was going on tour with an artist that I was uh, producing. But then he started touring and he came over the night before I left on this tour. And he said, here's another book that we can read to see if you like. And it was H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds, which I did take on tour with me. No mobile phones, no computers in that particular period, which was the early 60s. And it was the first book I read that on literally one reading that I fell in love with. It had all, all the sort of ingredients that I was looking for. It, it really nourished the soul, if that's a way of describing it. The storyline was very dark set in Victorian England when the British Empire was expanding its interventions or invasions, if you want to call it that. It had a lot to say, but it also had a lot of soul and just all the key emotions that on one read just sucked me in. But it was still in copyright in those days. And while I was on tour with the artist that I was uh, responsible for you know putting the bands together, conducting, etc. My dad found the son of H.G. Wells named Frank, who also had a brother named H.G. had a brother named Frank. The son had an agent, and by the time I came back from the tour, a meeting had been set up. We met Frank and the agents, very nice people, um, and they were enthusiastic to hear what attracted. My dad and I, and particularly me from the creating side of what I wanted to do with the War of the Worlds. And I said, well, here's all my reasons and including something that I think to this day no one has ever done, which is to keep it as a Victorian tale, keeping the characters, the, the placements pretty much the same as his dad had written. And I said, that's how I want to keep it. I'm not interested in modernizing it. I'm not trying to introduce things that or anything but the intention of what your dad created. And that's because it's just a brilliant piece. And the other thing, because he did go with that, but the other thing that cemented the deal, he said, I really like the idea of another father and son pairing oh, up here. Beautiful. Yeah. So beautiful. Those, were the, those were the two real factors that Frank agreed to sell my dad and I. What was all the remaining rights, which was excluding feature film rights because of the earlier film that had been made and the original book publication, right? So 
we bought everything else, which was more than I was hoping for. Uh, it was more than the music rights, so and it became quite valuable to us as my musical version when it came out, and it became, you know, joyfully I say, you know, a very successful work. And I guess that's why I'm still involved with it all these many years later. But the rights expired, and it's now in the public domain since I think it was 2016. And it explains why there are so many now new versions of the War of the Worlds, although most of them are called War of the Worlds, which is not the story that H.G. authored. He put the the in front because to him he was writing about the definitive war of all worlds, which is fine by me because that's what I call my musical version. Incredible. It's I suppose it's hard for people to fathom. It is for me to think about a Victorian author and then you get to talk to a son who presumably has vivid memories of his father. No. Now when we look at this in the 21st century, in 2023, that you're connecting with somebody who wrote a book, what, in 1898? That you yeah. can, You're one person away from talking to somebody that wrote a book in 1898. That's amazing. Uh, w- one thing that I've never forgotten is that when the War of the Worlds came out, it surprised even the record company. It was I was with CBS Records, which is now part of Sony. They just believed in it. There was no expectancy for it to do what it did and become all these years carrying on like it has in various forms. They just really loved it. But the counterpart in the United States, which was Columbia Records, they couldn't see it. They said, you know, this is a really interesting work. I mean, it holds up on every creative level, but who's going to buy it? You know, it's a continuous play. It's a double album. It's a story told by a Welsh actor, very well known and highly regarded, but this is supposed to be the pop world. So they dropped it. And then the chairman of CBS picked up the part that he didn't have, the 50% that they thought Columbia in America was going to retain but he didn't. So they wound up with 100% of it. I appeared fairly soon after the, the my original double album was released and became successful as it did. I appeared at a science fiction fair with Frank Wells. He was still alive. We chatted even more, but now we were much more friendly. A, because it had come out and been a great success. And I remember two things from that science fiction fair. Uh, One was, we're standing on a stage answering questions, and he said, my dad would have been very proud of this musical work. And the other thing, which had nothing to do with anything Frank said to me or me to him, is we had loaned the, the science fiction pair all my original artwork, all the paintings that we had commissioned to accompany the double album. And all of all but one came back, which to this day has never been retrieved. That's absolutely incredible. So your father and you meet Frank Wells. You obviously got so much more insight than I think anybody else could have through the fact that he's the son of the author. Um, still, I don't think I knew that, so I, th- I still find that overwhelmingly um, absolutely amazing. What I loved about that period, and maybe this is sort of a question I'm thinking of from the differences between Britain and America at the time, is that there was an absolute love for classical music in the 70s in Britain. And anything that had that flavor was given a lot more opportunity, as you're, as you're pointing to, than it ever was in, in America. But it, it was a leading light. In 1978, when, the, when your, the War of the Worlds came out, it was a time for like Kate Bush with like Wuthering Heights. It was like there was uh, a, a TV show a couple of years before, you, I'm sure you remember it, called The Enidian Line. And I believe, if I, my memory serves me right, it may not have been number one, but it was definitely a top 10 single of the theme tune, which was written by Katachurian, uh, you know, yeah, a right. Russian composer of like 100 years before. It, it's, it was just such a vibrant time. And that connection between rock and classical was so amazing what an exciting time to be composing and and creating music it's a very good observation you're making but when i set out to compose 
and produced the score along with interpret a script that my she was my stepmother, my dad's second wife, authored. It was the, just stay true to H.G. story. So anything that had classical influences, and they did. They had a big symphonic string orchestra, and I guess all the years of taking piano lessons. They paid off. Paid <laughs> off all those <laughs> lessons, yeah. <laughs> you know, sorry, I'm digressing, but when you say that, the first piano teacher I ever had was in New York, and he was a man. He was a, he was a New Yorker, but he dressed, to my mind, as I learned years later when I moved here uh, for the first time, he wore three piece tweed uh, uh, suits and a bow tie and was very proper like. But I also recall he had very long fingers, which is great for a pianist. But he also had long fingernails. And whenever I might make a mistake on scales or arpeggios, things that were fundamental to him, he'd press into my fingers and they hurt. Why did he do that to me? <laughs> Obviously to make a point. <laughs> I guess he had. his fingernails had points, that's for sure. Was, it, was he still alive when this came out? I have no idea, to be truthful, because I was around five years old. By the time the War of the Worlds came out, I was about 32, 33. I'm sure if he was, he would have been uh, very excited. I would have given him no credit, though. <laughs> but those fingernails. Well, you mentioned briefly Richard Burton. I mean, at that time in 1978, he was one of the biggest actors in the world. He'd already made some enormous movies, and very famously, probably by that time, had been married to Elizabeth Taylor multiple times. <laughs> how did you? How how did you get Richard Burton to do this? Probably. As best as I can describe it, dumb luck. And the reason or the way that I've always tried to explain it is that by the time I had sort of completed the first draft of my score, Doreen, my stepmom, she had finished the first draft of the script enough for us to identify all the key characters that we wanted to cast. All were going to be musical uh, performers with the exception of the storyteller, the journalist, who makes it, he's the only character that makes it all the way through the story. We were uh, wanting to cast somebody whose voice, the second you heard it, sort of sucked you into our world of the War of the Worlds. Richard's name was, wasn't a particularly long list, to be honest, but he was at the top of this list because his voice was just as good as it gets, you know, and uh, because he wasn't being filmed, it was the voice, and the same with within the whole double album. The voices had to sell whatever character they were playing. My dad and Doreen, we all agreed, boy, what a voice. And, and as you said just a minute or two ago, how popular he was. He was the first actor, apparently, to break the million dollar per film barrier, which in today's terms is probably not so much at all. But in those days, that era, it was, he was the first. But as we're going through talking about casting, we had some friends of ours who had just come back from New York from a holiday. And they came over for dinner just for a catch up. And so we've been to New York, we've done this, that, and the other. And one of the things we did was we just saw Richard Burton in a, a stage play on Broadway called Equus which became a movie which he also starred in. And I'm sort of thinking, you've just seen Richard Burton, eh? Um, and found out the name of the theater. No, no email, no, you know, nothing electronic available. In, <laughs> in those found out the name of the theater, and I just wrote to him, uh, sent with, with the first draft of the script. I introduced myself, explained that I'm a composer, musician, said uh, working on a musical interpretation of H.G. Wells's The War of the Worlds, and I'm enclosing, enclosing the first draft of our script. It's going to be a, a musical work, a double album, and I wonder if you'd you know, be interested in being the journalist. Sent it to the stage door of the theater that he was appearing in and hoped that the man in charge of the stage door would even give my little care package to Richard as he arrived at the theater or left it each day. And I presume, yeah, I'll never hear from, from him, full stop. 
it couldn't have been no more than three or four days that I got a call, a man named Robert Lance, who is Richard's personal manager. It was to my home, and it happened that my dad and Doreen were having dinner with me that night. We were talking about, you know, the project as well. And uh, he said, uh, hello, uh, this is Robert Lance here, uh, and I'd like to speak to Jeff Wayne. Please say, hello, Mr. Lance. Uh, it's, this is Jeff. And he said, well, uh, just to let you know that Richard did receive your care package and immediately read the script, and he just wanted to let you know that he loved it and to oh. count him in for the project. In fact, he said, count me in, dear boy. Those were oh. the exact words. Well, that... Uh, Robert Lance said, Richard said, uh, I was sort of in a state of numbness, you know, and I couldn't speak many words articulately at that point. I said, would you mind speaking to my dad? Because he's partnered with me on the War of the Worlds, and he, he could tell you more from a, a business side, a scheduling point of view. He said, yes, be very happy to. They did the deal, the entire deal, which was expressed eventually in two pages. Over the phone. And the only thing we had to accept uh, was that he was finishing his run in Equus in New York and was soon to leave for California to be in a film, which was the sequel to The Exorcist, meaning we would have to record him in California. No big deal, not if it meant recording Richard Burton. And my whole team, my production team, my engineer, and all the key people, we arranged a date, which wasn't that far away, in fact, we got on a plane and uh, recorded him then and there. Our, my dad did the whole contract over the phone, as I just said, and we had five days of studio time, 10 days, 10 hours, excuse me, 10 hours a day for five days. Richard did it all in one day, one short <laughs> day. He, he was that good, you know, and um, I don't know how else to explain it. He was so into the project. We have outtakes that saying, you know, on every, not, not often, but saying, oh, that was, those were delicious words. I really oh. like that particular section. And they've, they've appeared and we have a collector's edition that includes outtakes from everybody that was on the album. But the, many of them were the words that Richard spoke which we have to this day. Absolutely incredible. Maybe some of the U.S. viewers will, will, will know this, but I know you'll know this living in the UK, uh, Richard Burton's version of Under Milkwood oh, is yes. probably one of the greatest pieces of narration. So, I'm, you know, when was that, 1954 or something? Or, or before, I can't remember. To get Richard Burton to narrate your album would, would have just been the coup of all coups. In a way, getting the rights to the book, the H.G. Wells book, sure. was a, not a bad starting point. But when I then look at the next person on board, Richard Burton, I mean, we were flying. And all the other characters that were played by musical artists were very attracted to the whole thing. I, I did demos. I never expected just any musical artist to say, oh, sure, count me in. Okay, it's a good book. Uh, great uh, artist playing the journalist. Uh, no, I did full demos of each and every part, and almost all of them came into the studio as recording to hear what their part was going to consist of. Do you remember which studio you used in California? Yes, I do. Uh, Wally Hyder. Oh, Wally Hyder. Uh, which I think is still there. It was a highly renowned studio. The engineer that was with me for the entire production also from Wales, coincidentally, uh, he and Richard had some things to say, two Welshmen, uh, during the coffee breaks, so to speak. But yeah, it, it was an excellent, excellent uh, studio. And the, the voice mics are still classic mics that uh, I have in my own studio, which I'm speaking to you from now. Not that I'm looking at myself. You can't see very much of it. But I can see a piano in the background and what might be a Leslie or something on the other side. I can't tell. When you say Leslie, you mean uh, for an organ? I see. Yes, I'm not sure if it is, but I do see the piano behind you there, and on, on the right, uh, on your right hand side, I see a, what looks like a cabinet, but maybe it's just furniture. Yeah. No, it's a filing cabinet which I keep music and other things in, which is why it's standing there. It's a, a Steinway Concert Grand, nine foot six. Which oh, is, beautiful! I bought it at the beginning of when I started composing the War of the Worlds, and I, 
I had always dreamed of having this particular make and model. There are other great pianos, of course, but I don't know. That's the one I fell in love with. I loved the sound of it, and I was not prepared to buy anything until I could afford to go into Steinways in London and say, that one, and that was it. So here it is 48 years later or so, and uh, it's still with me and will always be with me. That's absolutely incredible. You just touched on the people you got to sing on this, which is a, a who's who of incredible singers, starting, I suppose, obviously with Justin Justin Hayward from the Moody Blues. Now, you're saying it was like a natural, you didn't have a difficulty after getting Richard Burton on board, but what what was that process? Did you have very strong feelings about who you wanted or was there suggestions? How did that come about? I definitely had strong views as to the type of singer that would be right for the role. My dad, Doreen, our uh, main lyricist, uh, Gary Osborne, he had a had a view. And when we got to an, an agreement, and I must say, casting the first double album of The War of the Worlds, it, it was it turned out to be pretty simple. And I only say that in a lot of hindsight. But yeah, with Justin, I was looking for a very, when I say classical, I don't mean in the classical sense, but the classic English voice as was perceived in that era. And Justin and the Moody Blues being the lead singer, he personified that to me. I had done demos for uh, the two main pieces he performed on the original double album and sent them a, a mix, a, a cassette mix. And in another letter, like I did to Richard introducing myself, he knew a bit of my work because by that time, uh, I enjoyed with the artist I was on tour with was an, an artist named David Essex, and we were having a great run of hit singles and albums. So he knew of that. He was at home when the cassette and letter arrived, and there was somebody with him that I think worked in one of the shops that the Moody Blues had, record stores of the day. And while Justin was playing, it was forever often, whoever was with him from the store said, that's that's a pretty nice song. Is that something you're going to record, Justin? Because Justin, I don't think, had uh, ever recorded anything other than what he wrote for the Moody's, possibly John Large. I don't know if they ever, while only in the Moody's, uh, composed together, but and that was sort of pretty much the extent of material in the Moody's period. So again, I had no expectancy because I was, I, I think if you're a fan of somebody's, whatever work that they do, it's harder to break the barrier and say, hey, mate, come on down and let's try to work together or something, you know, Absolutely. try to personalize it. But again, I got a very fast reaction saying, you know, I like this song. I'd like to, like to record it, I'd like to become what was the sung thoughts of the journalist. I suppose from a fan's perspective, there it was no more logical person. Just like Richard Burton is the number one choice that you'd want to narrate it. Justin Hayward, I, I mean, you think of the Moody Blues, obviously their biggest hit and one of the biggest hit singles in the world is essentially based off of Air and a G-String by Bach, and it has classical influences. Days of Future Having Past is a classical, you know, masterpiece with rock music. I mean, he's the guy. It's like you're, you're aiming for the right person. Once again, like you say, you want the English sensibility being that it was an English writer. There was nobody more perfect. Talk about uh, getting the right man for the right job. Well, thanks for saying that. You know, I, I was a fan. You know, it was as simple as that. I didn't quite analyze it as well as you've articulated. I just think that we got on a roll. It had a smell about it in the time that it was being created, uh, which you highlighted earlier, and it just was meant to be. You know, there, there were very few issues that could have sunk it other than if nobody liked it, which wasn't the way it turned out. So you mentioned David Essex. David also appears. How did you end up working with David Essex? What was the... Well, there was, there was a, a connection by the time we did The War of the Worlds in that I first met David when he was in the... West End production of the musical called Godspell. And it just happened that I was going out with a girl who was in the show, 
at the time. And I hung out to see my girlfriend. We go out for dinner after the show and got to know the cast, who also at times would come out for dinner and got friendly with, with most of them. As a result of that, I asked David to sing on a commercial because I was doing lots of commercials in those days, a lot, and some film work and TV shows. So he started doing sessions for me, which for him at that point in his career was helpful for the young family that he had. But he was breaking big as an artist in his own right, playing Jesus in Godspell. And we had just finished a commercial sitting around in the studio over a cup of tea, chatting. We probably finished early rather than being kicked out over running on a session. He said, by the way, you know, I, I write songs. And he had been, he was on a label that for whatever the reasons with the producer and he made some good records, but they didn't click. Simple as that. But he said, I've got this new song. I wonder, could I play it for you? Knew we had some spare time left in the studio. And I said, well, look, there's a, 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 a microphone still over the, the piano, which we had on our session. You fancy going out and our engineer will turn the microphone on and off you go. I'll get a good idea of it. And so he said, sure. He went in, he sat down at the piano, but he didn't start playing or singing. He picked up the trash, as we, we say, I guess, in England here, the trash bin, not the garbage bin, but the trash. The rubbish bin. Turn the rubbish. I beg your pardon. That's quite all right. It's it's yeah. fun to be English with you. <laughs> the rubbish bin. Yes. The rubbish bin. Absolutely. <laughs> there wasn't a lot in it, but he turned it over. I don't know if you can see me, but put it between his legs. Yeah. And started banging out a rhythm. I thought, oh, that's different. I was expecting him to sing and play the piano. He couldn't really play the piano, but he was a damn good drummer percussionist. So the song came out of him called Rock On, which it wasn't the same tempo. It was a faster version of what I recorded with him, but it was good enough to sort of get our engineer going with ideas. And one of them was because the name of Jimmy Dean, James Dean, was in the lyric. I, and I asked him, his name was Gary, I said, you think you can turn some 50s echo on David's voice? He said, yeah, I'm sure we can do so. Anyway, we got through the song and the demo. And the next thing was we had a rough version of Rock On. And I met with the head of the label that he was on, asking if he would release David or sell me the contract or something like that. And he was very amicable. And I have a feeling he must have in his own mind felt that they had tried, I think it was three singles. None of them really worked well enough to get excited about. And he said, okay, let's do a deal. And it was a real simple one. I didn't, I don't recall any money passing between us. It was just a, a legal release from his label onto my label. And then I put my own money into making the master of rock on and a B side. When I say B side, actually, it wasn't determined what was going to be the A side. First, we had to record them. Rock on really just had a sound about it right from the get go. The B side was a very pretty ballad, very much for a pop artist who had an audience of young ladies who would scream no matter what the artist sang. When I got through recording Rock On, it, it just had its own sound about it. And I look back, and, and I've been asked this before, what gave it the type of sound that it had? And I said, well, it's because I didn't use any musicians that played keyboards or guitars. It's just bass, drums, and tuned untuned percussion, uh, which gave a lot of hollow in the track. And I didn't add anything until after that was a chord, a chordal instrument. I did add strings, but nothing really that gave it this feeling of chords or richness. It was like almost uh, an Indian lick that I wrote for the strings and a small brass section, which also had its own approach to the, the arrangement. When we finished the two tracks, the masters, they were, they were masters, I started uh, being introduced to record labels. Everybody that heard it, David, and he was now quite hot being Jesus in the West End at that point. Everybody who I 
players who put offers in. And to cut this story short, we wound up with CBS Records. Uh, there was a view that the B side was the type of song that David should come out with, a handsome guy and wanted to get the following of the girls. David and I wanted Rock On because it had an edge and it sounded different. By good fortune, they CBS allowed us to have Rock On and it took off. We had a, a run of about five years, something like 10, 12 top 10 singles, a couple of number ones. Rock On reached number one on uh, one of the big charts in America, touring started. And so you asked the question, how did I get David on to play the artillery man, this young common soldier in the War of the Worlds? And the answer was, I called him up and I just said to him something like, David was my nickname for him. And uh, David? I said, David, <laughs> yeah. David, David, you fancy being an artillery man in this, this project that I'm involved with? I said, you don't have to say yes. All you have to do is say you're interested enough to come and hear the demos that I had finished of the material that he was to sing and to act with the journalist, Richard Burton. He was in, in the studio with me within a day or two, and he Amazing. loved it. Yeah, and he was on board as that, including coming to California when I went there to work with Richard with all of my team. We have some great pictures of them and me together with Richard, with my dad, with Doreen, and he did a wonderful job. That's it. That's the answer to your question. Sorry if it was too long. No, no, it's perfect. I, lo I love the, the the stuff on Rock On. Rock On is a masterpiece of, of production. You know, the double-tracked Herbie Flowers bass kind of creating that kind of slap effect with, like you're saying, with the percussive elements and then the sparing use of strings and brass, and it just makes it all about the vocal. And it's interesting you were saying they wanted him to probably be kind of a, you know, a crooner kind of thing for all the girls could kind of fall in love with him. But that was the perfect production for the girls to fall in love with him because it's all about the vocal. Well, you, you know, it's a, you're quite right. They, they were, at the time, I think they were comparing David with David Cassidy. Right. Uh, he had that sort of following. Um, and why not? He filled exactly the sort of criteria that David could have. But he didn't see himself like that as an artist. Of course, I did say to him, why did you write the song? It's called On and On. Because uh, I agree with you. I think we've got more lifetime as a partnership, you as the artist and me as your producer, arranger, than a ballad like that. And he just, he, he didn't write specifically. He wrote what came out of him. I think a true artist does that. So I always admired that. But Rock On was the thing that really took off for him immediately. And uh, we started touring pretty soon thereafter, about a year later, because CBS wanted a, a couple more records that came out uh, before he started touring, which in those days, you know, live touring was about how you sold more records rather than today, which is how you break records, you know, or, or break an artist, I should say. Anyway, that was it. That was it with Rock On. And also, you mentioned Herbie, Herbie Flowers, who up until our last tour, last March and April, had been in every tour of the War of the World since we started doing the arenas in the UK and, and other countries. And we started in 2006. So he did every tour. And he, he had problems with his eyes by that point, And he had to uh, drop out for a while. But you never know. We're touring again in a couple of years. With, uh, not announced yet, but yeah, we know where we're going with it. So you never know. Herbie might, and I hope, might want to come back. The bass guitar tracked up an octave was his idea, and he did it on the Lou Reed Walk on the Wild Side single. That's where he started those very quirky ideas. But it's also what gave me the idea of having no chords from guitarists or keyboardists filling up, I mean, they, it could have been arranged. I could have arranged it tr more traditionally. I loved Walk on the Wild Side. I mean, who didn't? But it's the double track bass, although I think his was a double bass, not a bass guitar. But the, the effect was the same, an octave apart, and it gave a lot of space to the, the limited amount of other musicians that made up the band. And in fact, 
there were only three of them. And when the band session was called for 10 in, mo- 10 in the morning on whatever day it was, the three of them are standing there. I'm standing in front of two microphones, not that far apart, because the one thing that I did do, I can't even say as a musician, but it goes into the song after the intro and you hear, and it was a left, right stereo effect that I can claim is my appearance on Rock On. But the three of them, they're waiting and they're looking around now, 10 o'clock on the spot. And eventually one of them said, Jeff, when's the rest of the band arriving? It's It's gone 10. I said, guys, you are the band and I'm going to count you in. And I had talked them through the type of approach, less is more type of usage of space, etc. And off we went and they just got into it. Herbie then added his octave up after we had the basic backing track. Those tenths that he plays on Walk on the Wild Side, it's interesting. I've, I, I had read some of the connection you're talking about. Uh, Herbie has a, a unique ability, doesn't he, to get to the source of what's going to make something. I mean, we're talking two songs, Rock On and Walk on the uh, on the Wild Side, where the, the bass line is such an integral part and allow that vocal to be shown off. So... I, it's interesting. You're saying you'd already heard "Walk on the Wild Side," and so you thought to, my, thought to yourself that would be an interesting approach. And I, 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 I love that you mentioned that. I think that's very, very and powerful. By sheer coincidence, I was asked to produce Lou Reed, and he came over. Wow! Yeah, spent a weekend with me. Well, he was coming over to. Let me put it in the correct perspective. He was coming <laughs> over to the gig at the round, not the roundhouse. Sorry, it was very well known. It wasn't an arena, but it held about three, 4,000 people. He invited me to this gig. He hung out in my studio in London with me for a good chunk of the day. We talked through, and I really thought, I'm going to work with Lou Reed. Then I went to see the show, and I had gotten great seats. And he came on, and he was, let's, I'll just keep it. Loki. He was, let's just say, intoxicated. <laughs> try turns, you know, like artists can do, do a twirl and grab the microphone and perfect timing to the beat of whatever song. And uh, he came on, did his twirl and missed the microphone and almost fell into the front rows of the, um, the audience. And I'm thinking, I'm too young a producer uh, and probably not up to working with somebody who is a genius, but has a lifestyle that I, I frankly wasn't. I'm, I've never been a drinker. We had a, a connection. We were both represented by the same talent agency, the William Morris office. I just bowed out as gracefully as I could, biting my tongue as I was saying no, because I knew I was missing an amazing opportunity and I'm sure there's other details that I'm not remembering, but uh, it it didn't happen. But I did have the privilege of hanging out with him and him coming over to my house. I was living in London at the time. He wanted he wanted to see my electronic studio because I had one of the first Moog three synthesizers installed by Robert Moog, and he I did I I showed him all the bits and pieces, and then I went to his gig, and I'm really pissed off here that I can't remember the name of the uh, the venue. I'm sorry. Water Rats, I played there. Oh, Rainbow, the Rainbow. Yes, thank you very there much. There it was. That was the one we were thinking of, yeah. The <laughs> Rainbow. I have passed there uh, a bunch of times through the years, and it, it was no longer the Rainbow, yeah. But that was a major gig, and some of the biggest bands particularly played there. And Lou Reed, that's where he did the show that I went to see. One thing we didn't touch on, we talked a little bit about, obviously, you know, Britain in the 70s. And I suppose a couple of things I love about it is it's 1978. And so punk rock and even post-punk at that point in 78 was massive. But you couldn't put down, you know, the, the, the fact that people still wanted to hear, like, beautiful music and we'd had such a rich history from the late 60s with crimson and genesis and all this stuff of 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 prog i suppose progressive rock um was rick wakeman's i mean i think a couple of people have written about it what is was uh his journey to the center of the earth any kind of influence or is that just a a, a dumb kind of thing to say because of course it's a jules verne uh, 
Oh, not at all. And it's a, it's a good analogy. But the truth is, uh, in fact, I, I know Rick. He played on some of my early commercials. That's how I first met him. He wasn't the Rick Wakeman. He was Rick Wakeman. Yeah. <laughs> so I got him at a good time, like Herbie, uh, you know, and Chris Spedding, who, again, re- remained with me throughout my career by just very good fortune. But I think I was bloody minded. In truth, I had an idea for how I wanted to try creating a musical work. Prog rock has been uh, a category the War of the Worlds has been put in. I've won awards through the prog rock world, and I'm very proud of them. I, it's not a denial of anything. I just never saw it as that in the sense of... I, d- I, I don't was- either. To, to Sorry to interrupt you. I don't either, and I don't know if anybody did at the time. For, for context, for people watching this, I don't think we... When that came out, it was first of all, it was a breath of fresh air. It just seemed to be so different to anything else. And I think the prog rock analogy is an oversimplification and understandable because people like to we like to try and compartmentalize things and to make it make sense to us. But it's an enigma in in the best sense of the word. Well, at least it wasn't an enema in the nice sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it is. It did walk a line there because nobody knew, including the record company, if anybody was going to like it or was just going to disappear because it didn't fit into a category. You know, you mentioned prog rock uh, and punk rock. Punk rock and disco were the two real heavy uh, music mediums of the day. And there I was coming out with Continuous work, a double ar- album. How arrogant could anybody be? Continuous play, so there's no cuts on this double album to even make it easy for radio stations, even if they wanted to play a tune from my double album. I actually, I, that I was smart enough to realize, or semi smart enough to realize that uh, I better do what I called an, an airplay album. And I cut all the main songs and themes down to, you know, single length type of of lanes and put it onto an album and cbs agreed and it was sent to all the radio stations up front and it was a a radio airplay album again it was one of the maybe the only smart thing that i did in that period because it did get received by the media right from the get-go i think it surprised everybody and the first song released was forever autumn which justin sung beautifully on and we got a big hit out of it many different countries uh, and that got us going ironically that radio airplay album was we changed its name and there's now been several versions over the years but it became known as the highlights album which was all these singles cuts and cbs just said oh thank you so much we didn't know how to promote and sell the double album to start with um, and now you've given us like a pop album. And it's now, I mean, it's far less in sales than uh, the original double album, which is up now with about 16 million, maybe a little more. But we're approaching 2 million of those highlights albums, which was just the result of a razor blade. We were in the still in the world of tape. Incredible. Could you tell me a little bit about the writing process for Forever Autumn? Because such a beautiful beautiful song did you have the music first and then you went to get lyrics in a more traditional kind of composition way um or was there a collaborative process on it it really wasn't any of that to start with good (laughs) Uh, and I, i wish i had thought all those years ago the credibility i probably lost when i admitted when i was asked these sort of questions how did forever autumn come about and the truth is that I was commissioned to compose music for a new Legos TV commercial. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the full song that it became. It was the length of the first verse. So the melody goes, do, 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 et cetera, to the end of the verse. And I had the, the two guys that became the lyricists of the full song. They were doing a lot of commercials and uh, TV work uh, for me on sessions. We did this commercial for Lego, and very soon after it was shown on TV, members of the public were writing and saying, well, what is that? That's a really nice tune. 
is it available as a record? And it wasn't. It, you know, it was a 30 second TV commercial. It worked very well. Their voices, big, wide chords and things like that really gave it a nice quality. But we never thought about it beyond that's a nice commercial. It's working very well. Now, if we jump forward, their names were Paul Vigrass and Gary Osborne. And before I signed David to my label, I had signed them first under the name of Vigrass and Osborne. And our debut album came out on what was MCA Records, now part of Universal. It was the label that Elton John was signed to, which broke him, certainly in the United States, probably all over the world. It had no words. So I extended the music. Now we had a full song. They wrote the, the lyrics, and it became a song known as Forever Autumn. And it appeared on their debut album called Cues. It was the B-side to the first single in the United States. It was flipped in Japan. For some reason to this day, I've never learned why, because the A-side wasn't a, a top 10 hit or higher, it, uh, but it was around top 20, top 30. In Japan, Forever Autumn got up to about number three. And suddenly in Japan, anyway, Vigress and Osborne uh, were popular. And they did tours there, or at least two that I recall or a lot of promotion and a tour. That was it. Everything worked just fine. Now, a couple of years later, I'm starting on the War of the Worlds. And it came to a point in the story where our, where our leading man, the journalist, Richard Burton, had made his way on foot from his home in Surrey to try to find his fiance named Carrie, who was living in London with her father. The Martians now were invading England. And he was worried about her. No telephones, no, no email, none of that. And 1898, uh, yes. <laughs> so what do you want from 1898? <laughs> so he makes his way on foot, meets up with an artilleryman, David Essex. He wants to rejoin his battalion, who he gets separated from because of the Martians. And the journalist, I gave the name to you, by the way, I'm sorry, I'm digressing here, of George Herbert. H.G. stood for Herbert George, Herbert George Wells. So I turned H.G. around to George Herbert. He makes his way on foot, arrives at the home of his fiance and her father, but they're not there. The invasion had gotten them on the road to trying to find a safe haven from London. And he arrives at the house and there's nobody there. And the key lyric of the song, Forever Autumn, is because you're not here. And I kept thinking, you know, Forever Autumn, it's a perfect song at this place within the War of the Worlds. And I then kept saying, no, 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 everything is going to be, a, you know, 100% original. And anyway, there's the PRS that uh, I had signed away to uh, the publishing company of Forever Autumn. But I kept coming back to... Forever Autumn. I said, no, no, it's it's the perfect song. And I eventually gave in when I had no more time to wait. And that's how Forever Autumn made it onto the War of the Worlds. And I'm glad I succumbed to art rather than greed. That was such a great quote. You succumbed to art rather than greed. I know when I moved to America, that is not the truth. You get albums chosen, whoever like the most popular writer or producer is, their tracks will get chosen over some of the better songs just because that's the business thing to do. And so it's wonderful to hear you say, succumb to art over greed. Thank you very much for saying that. I, I can say that The War of the Worlds is one of the only things I I can think of that I would not be dissuaded by anybody to do other than what I felt. And as I said, that's why I went for the art of the song of Forever Autumn. It's entertained a lot of people. Justin put it into his act, whether it's the Moody's or he does a lot of solo work. And I feel honored that of the material that he's done that and written with the Moody's and other work of his, he's kept Forever Autumn in his repertoire. So, uh, yeah, thank you for saying that. No, it's a beautiful quote. We're still scraping the surface of so many things. Chris Thompson from Manfred Mann's uh, Earth Band. How did you get hold, hold of Chris? How did that come together? The truth was that the original concept, after Justin was on board, the song that follows Forever Autumn is a song called Thunder Child. It's the battle, be the climactic battle that ends the first of the two albums between Mankind and Martians. I thought I had an 
a reasonably nice idea by asking John Lodge to be the handover from Justin in Forever Autumn to Thunderchild. And John really liked the idea, heard Thunderchild, and came into the studio and we recorded it. The only thing that happened was that um, it wasn't in the right key for him. As great a voice as he has, it really was too high for him because it's got a couple of power notes at the very top range. A tone or so down and it would have he would have nailed it. The problem was that if I wanted to re-record it, separate from the cost, I would have had to wait something like three months because the Moody's were going on tour immediately. I, I felt that was a bit too long to wait uh, past a certain point where it was becoming just a problem with the production plans. And Gary Osborne, who I mentioned earlier, had introduced me to Chris on some commercials. So that was my first introduction to Chris. So I had known him by the time he came into the studio. But Chris has one of the big rock voices, you know, that you can imagine. Number one was Blinded by the Light in, in America with Manfred Mann, etc. Chris came in and just nailed it. He was on board and I felt uh, I was going through a lot. As much as I was so thrilled that John was not only interested, but was prepared to come back and finish it off if I had lowered the key, Chris wound up doing the voice of humanity. And he also toured with us from 2006 right through to, to the end of 2010. Absolutely wonderful. Now, you're talking about going through a lot. Let's not uh, get away from the fact that in, uh, CBS initially off offered you £35,000 to make the album, which was, a, was in those days quite a considerable sum of money. And then eventually they went up to 70000 Correct me if I'm wrong, but I've read that you personally put in £170,000 of your own money. That's true. It's Incredible. No, no correction needed. But the background was that when I first explained the concept to the chairman, of, who was the chairman in London, CBS, and then he, he moved on and became the vice president of Columbia in New York, he was the one I made the first presentation to, a lovely man actually named Dick Asher, who I'd gotten to know over years working with David, and now I'm presenting the War of the Worlds to him in New York, because I was touring with David, we were doing some gigs in New York and, and other places in the States. And he said, you know, I love this idea, can you give me a budget? And all I could think of was the budget that I had to produce a David Essex album, 35,000 pounds. Which, as you said, that was a reasonable sum in those days. I had bands, I had a string section, occasional brass band, backing vocals. You know, it was pretty full on to do those an album for thirty five thousand, and uh, I I did them, and I think we had a spare pound or two for some uh, French fries and and chips that we got from the the shop next door. I finished the deal with the head of business affairs in London uh, because I didn't have time to finish it off when I was in New York. So I came back from the tour uh, with David and went to see him. Another guy that I had a lot of dealings with and became a, a good friend with named Paul Russell. It's where I met my wife. She was the, his PA. He was the head of business affairs. Uh, he left, but uh, Geraldine, my wife, didn't. So we've just passed 46 years of marriage. The deal I did was for a 35,000 pound album. It was going to have no guest artists, no commission paintings. Uh, and then I started thinking about what did I just sell for 35,000 quid here? There's no chance of this fitting into a single album. And I started realizing that I needed guest artists because there was going to be acting, there was going to be songs that were going to be sung. And I did feel that the album would be heavily supported by a commission series of paintings that gave the listener, if they were really wanting to get involved with the, the War of the Worlds, an idea of the look of Victorian England, all the things, the key things that were coming out in the story. So I sort of humbled myself and begged Paul Russell for another 35,000 pounds because it was now a double album. He went with it. You know, there was no issue. And then the first artist that signed on, as you, you know, was Richard Burton. And I said, Paul, I don't have money for Richard Burton. 
and he covered the cost of Richard's fee. The deal was struck. And then as all the other artists were coming on board, they were covering the costs of uh, their fees. The final cost that was had by uh, CBS was not just the 70000 but yeah, I think it actually came out at about 90000 to be honest. But the total sum of the double album was 240000 And there was a moment in time when I ran out of CB- CBS's money, and I came back. I had my new wife, my father, and Doreen. And I said, guys, um, we just ran out of CBS's money. So here's the choice. We just wave our white flag to the Martians. And uh, I'm a a working musician, so I can still make a a living here. Or I can take our life savings and put it into whatever the final cost was, which was 240000 and just hope for the best. And they all said the same thing. Look, you're never going to get probably another chance like this to start with a blank page and do what you like. And what you've done so far is sounding different and good. So they gave me the final say or the final approval, so to speak, of going for it, which is what I did. And it did cost 240,000 pounds. Pretty much to the penny, you know. I'm as I'm saying, it went up for ninety thousand. I think it no, it was it was seventy or seventy five thousand. It was just that the second thirty five thousand was not specific. It was just do a second album to accompany the first. I need to check my facts to go back on such a long time ago. But anyway, that's the, the true background to it. And I finished the album, and the rest uh, in terms of its acceptance by the public and the media followed when it was eventually released. I'm a huge, huge Thin Lizzy fan. So Phil Lynott, um, what was the connection there? How did you get Phil on this? Again, it's I, when I think back, you know, and how we're chatting about how this all came about, uh, it was a, a piece of just good, dumb luck. I, I had come to the part in the story where HULs created a curate, a man of the cloth, which by the time I came to do my musical version of The War of the Worlds, I thought a curate was not really as well known as a parson. So that's one of my few cheats on HG. But when I chatted to, to his son, Frank, he said, that's all fine. He wouldn't have been upset at all by what you've done. So now I wanted a parson. And the parson was a man of the cloth the sort of person you'd go to, particularly in your local community or even maybe the bigger cities, in times of grief, personal loss, or certainly a Martian invasion. And you'd go for for all the the spirit you could, as a, a parson, give to your flock, to your community, to give them a feeling of comfort and safety. Not so. Uh, Parson Nathaniel <laughs> became the first person that goes totally bonkers. He loses it. He thinks the Martians are the devil, and they're coming to sort of clear out humanity because of the evil that's from within them. Not just evil, but you know the odd little machine and heat ray that helped them along. He he lost faith. He really was the first person to lose faith. His wife Beth name that that I gave to that character, she was the real opposite. Um, And she, at the peak of his madness, tried to restore his faith in mankind to bring back love between them. And no matter how long this duet called The Spirit of Man prevailed, she couldn't succeed. And ultimately, he succumbed. She And then she died as well. Actually, she dies before Parson Nathaniel perishes uh, because a cylinder lands on the house that she was taking shelter, along with Nathaniel and the journalist, in fact, but they survive. And he um, realizes that she's gone. She's, she's dead. And that's pretty much the final straw. And he rushes out to confront the Martians with his cross. The journalist can't stop him. He's he, the, the parson, is making far too much noise. And 
the Martians have a machine called a handling machine, which is faster. There's three main machines that we learn about, but this handling machine has claws and it picks up surviving humans who are running for their lives. And at this particular moment, the handling machine have sight of him in the house that he and now the journalists are taking shelter in. And this claw comes creeping down stairs and eventually reaches and can touch him and drag him out. And he's very much alive and up in the air. And then on the back of the handling machines themselves is a metal basket. And the Martians inside control the claws and drop whoever they've captured, in this case, the parson, into the metal basket. And the Martians inside feed off of the living blood of the humans, Arson Nathaniel now being one of them. So he's perished. That's a real quick summary about Parson Nathaniel and the character. And the person I wanted, I didn't want just somebody who had a great voice and could sing the power. Uh, I wanted somebody who could express the madness, the loss, everything that this long duet between husband and wife brings out. I was a fan of Finn Lizzy. It was was really as simple as that. And Phil's name came to me, not just because of being a fan of Finn Lizzy's, but there was one particular song that he had recorded with them called Fool's Gold. And it's a song where maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds maximum, he speaks at the beginning. And this magnificent rock voice has turned into a dramatic moment of, of that lane that sets the song up. And I thought, gosh, that's Parson Nathaniel. Okay, here we go again. I've got no chance of getting him. He turned out to be not just a friend, but he started working in my production company in London at the time. And he was very experienced in publishing. So that's what he was working on within my company. But he knew the managers of Thin Lizzy quite well and set up an introduction. Uh, first, they had to ask Phil, does this sort of quirky project have any interest to you? And the, and he said, yeah, actually, it's pretty interesting. And by that time, I had Richard on board. I had David on board, Justin, all done. And Julie Covington, who wound up playing his wife, was due to come in. She hadn't yet come in to play the role. So he was keen enough to come and have a listen. And we got on really well because he was a real... Um, classic rock and roll, sort of tasting the fine wines of the day and being humongously talented. He loved what he heard because I demoed it like I had done with everybody. In truth, in fact, I've just remembered the first person I went to, I had scored and produced a movie and a soundtrack album that uh, was for The Who. Roger Daltrey played the lead in the movie and on on the album, the cast album. And I asked Roger and his manager and the Who's manager and the manager of Led Zeppelin and others like that. I said, Roger, would you be interested? And I told him about this role. And he said, yeah, I'd I'd have an interest. And uh, so he came in with his manager, Bill Kirbishley. And he said, boy, there's some really great stuff in there. He said, but I've just finished a, a movie that he played a priest. Uh, and I struggling to remember the name of the movie, but he said, otherwise, I'd really been very keen. In fact, so I'm telling you the story the wrong way round. I had just gone to Roger and Bill because I was a fan. They knew me because of my work with David Essex and a few other things that I had done. So Roger came in and eventually said, no, I, I just don't want to play two people of the of the cloth in a row, essentially, albeit one's a movie and one's on on this work. He was very sympathetic to the War of the Worlds because they had done Tommy, they had done other conceptualized works, which I hate the name of, but that's the best way to explain it. I didn't do a prog rock album. I didn't do a concept album. I just did The War of the Worlds, a musical version of his book called The War of the Worlds. That's why it's called Jeff Wayne's musical version of The War of the Worlds, nothing else. So. Then when I was on the trail again for a parson, that's when I thought of Fool's Gold, Thin Lizzy, Phil Linus. And Phil was on board 
immediately. And he was very special as a guy. He, he wrote poetry and prose. who's really the opposite of all the whatever you want to label rock and rollers to be. He was a very sensitive soul. And on the last day of recording The War of the Worlds, he gave me this book. To me, it was a bit of poetry and prose in one book. And it, his message to me inside of the book was just very special. And it has pride of place in our, our little library in the house. He was wonderful. My dad, being the actor, singer that he was, helped Phil perform to bring out performance of a character. They got on great. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier about outtakes of Richard Burton and all the things that could go wrong with outtakes or something special. I have tons of those between my dad and Phil. And they signed off at the end of the sessions by doing a bit of cabaret together. My father on piano playing T for two and uh, Phil accompanying on vocals and mad dialogue between the two of them. And then obviously with Roger, that relationship maintained and you ended up doing McVicker. Yes, indeed. And again, I was a, a huge fan of The Who, and Roger's voice, I think, is, is one of the great rock singers uh, of all time. And the only briefing that Roger and Bill, and from the rest of the band, but particularly Roger and Bill, Bill Kerbishley, their manager, gave me was, Jeff, we know you love writing for big string orchestras, no matter the artist, the project, you always seem to get big string orchestras in. I said, I like writing for strings, guys. What can I tell you? So, but I, I haven't written for strings in everything in my life. There's certainly one or two percent that I didn't. Just kept it straight rock or pop or whatever. One of the songs th that I didn't write for McFricker was called Without Your Love. And it's a beautiful song. And I kept saying to myself, I've got to get some strings in here. I can't stand this. This song deserves string writing. And I thought, I'll never get it past Roger and the band, the, the management. So I did the backing tracks, but I worked with one of the keyboarders that I shared the keyboards with on the, the, the score was the same keyboardist who was on the War of the Worlds. That we, we just split the tasks. And his name is Ken Freeman, his nickname I gave as Prof. And Prof was because I thought he was a genius. And he invented probably to this day the best string machine that I've ever heard. Yeah, his string machine was desired by a couple of the big manufacturers, and he didn't want to do it. He was not into uh, the commercialism of his string machine. So I thought, oh, I'm going to sneak my Ken string machine in on the arrangement of Without Your Love. Without Your Love got to number two on the AOL charts in the United States, and Rogers performed it in concerts on his own. It is a beautiful song. Billy Nichols is the songwriter and deserves all the credit for this beautiful song. But I was so pleased I snuck in the string arrangement because they actually liked it. The Who actually liked it. Maybe because it wasn't a big symphonic string orchestra, but it had the textures of real strings and the emotion. So I got my strings in in one form or another. Is that how he got his prof nickname from, from his inventive side? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. He was a, like a, not just a, a, a great keyboardist but he was an inventor he was a he was like a, a mad genius his string machine became very well known certainly here in the uk probably elsewhere he's had articles i believe written about him in the string machine the freeman string machine and freeman otherwise known as prof was part of the expense of the record obviously all of his incredible musicians and talents and you know this was one of the first records to be done on 48 track. Yeah, yeah. I, l let me just, if I may, say Please. that every guest artist, from Richard right through to all the, the vocalists, all the band members who mostly were really top drawer, you know, they were the governors of the day. They all, the, the, the band did recession fees, and the guest artists just accepted the fees that we had available in our budget. It was growing in its own on its own merit. They were enjoying it their participation so uh, it wasn't for free don't let me suggest that <laughs> but it wasn't for big fees that got me up to two hundred forty thousand smackers it was the fact that th there were so many ingredients it took me about a year and a half to record uh and about a year and a half to compose arrange and get ready for the sessions 
But the, the 48 track machine wasn't either the, the big deal from a cost point of view, because by the time it was offered to me, the studio that I did almost all of the recording of the War of the Worlds, excluding Rich. Well, actually, Richard came back and finished his work at the same studio. The strings were recorded in Abbey Road Studios in London, which was a famous studio, and particularly its Studio One for its the size and strings and orchestras. It just had and still does a reputation, almost, I guess, unbeatable, if you, if you want to consider it amongst the great studios for that type of work. It was just the accumulation of quantity, I think, and, and other costs that if I wanted to do it in a particular way, that was what it was going to cost. You know, traveling to California with about half a dozen of my team, hanging out for a week until Richard was able to get away from his film commitments. So the studio, of course, was AdVision. With the exception of the strings at Abbey Road and most of Richard's recording and David's in the scenes that he and the artillery man did together, it was Wally Hyder's, and that, that was it. Amazing. My cousin just texted me, and uh, I, I, I had to say, look, I'm on, I'm on with Jeff Wayne, and he goes, that's effing amazing, one of the first vinyl albums I ever had with such awesome artwork. Wow. All my friends and family are all sort of connected in music some way, shame or some way. We, we, we well, didn't stray far from the, uh, from the tree. As it were. Well, please thank him for saying that. It's really nice. For our age group, anyone from probably the age of about 45 to 60 is just going to have a massive memory of that. You know, we just, we, we grew up with it. Um, incredible, incredible. And obviously millions more bearing how successful. I believe, I think I read somewhere that's the fifth biggest selling album in Britain of all time. It's something like that. I've, you know, every, I don't know how often, five years, whatever. Uh, the chart company does one of these charts of best-selling albums of all time. And it's always in there, and it's it's been high, it's been lower, but never out of the top 30 from my memory. But it's been as high as about number five, yeah. 330 consecutive weeks in the British charts is something that I'm really proud of. And it's continually over the years popped in and out. It was also the number one uh, catalog album, as they call it in the UK for one given year, which was, to me, a real, I mean, it's for anything other than a new album of that year. And I see my name above, because it was number one in that given year, Michael Jackson, Coldplay, you know, you name whoever the biggest artists of that given year were. And there I am with the War of the Worlds and all the people that gave me their talent sitting on top. That's absolutely amazing. So for the technical, um, I read that you had the two 24-track machines looked, linked together with the MagLink, but there was some issues with the MagLink. Every day. Every day? Yeah, but AdVision owned a company literally next door attached to AdVision. In fact, they had a connecting door. The company was called Felden, and they were one of the first and best companies to hire gear. Now, you know, it's done uh, all over the place. But Felden was the first company, I think the only company, to ever have a MagLink. Uh, and the manager of the studio, who was also an excellent engineer in his own right, was hearing sounds coming out of AdVision. It was the main studio that we worked almost entirely in, Studio One. And his office as the manager was literally just outside the doors of uh, Studio One. And he said... He came in one day and said, Jeff, um, this is really sounding quite different, very special. And AdVision would like to offer you no cost to a thing called a MagLink. It's the first device. It's come over from America. We just received it. And it's the first machine that will connect two devices. It didn't have to be 24-track machines. It could be two two-track machines or whatever. But he knew I was already on a 24-track production. He said, so, and we do have two 24-track machines. So if you're interested, we can experiment. They had a very good, unusual to most major studios. On site, downstairs, they had a team that took care of things that went wrong and repairs and all of that. He said, so if anything should go wrong, not that we'd expect it, you've got <laughs> our team downstairs. I knew all the guys. I said, gosh, 48 tracks, what can I do with 48 tracks? I grabbed the opportunity. 
I mean, if it wasn't every day, it wasn't far off that I'm sitting patiently with my arms crossed in the in the back of the room on the sofa, <laughs> falling asleep, waiting for today's disaster to be repaired. That's what happened. But it was brilliant because it wasn't just the fact that I could work with 48 tracks. It was slave 24 track tapes that we work out a, a way of. So we had one master 24 track tape that had all the key instruments from like a band point of view, anything lead so that the 24 tracks was the constant. The second 24 track machine became what's known as the slave. So say, for example, I filled up that second 24 track machine with um, lots of voices, put that away and mix down to say two tracks as guides to have all those voices on what we call the master 24 track. And then maybe tons of guitars and synthesizers would fill up another one or two slave multi-tracks and bounce them onto the master tape, et cetera, until eventually we wound up with 75 multi-track tapes that made up the eventual master recording. 75, that's that incredible. 25, yeah, if you multiply 75 by 20, four tracks of which many of those tracks were mixed out so the amount of sounds that were on these tracks i'm not even going to try to do my multiple <laughs> and eat up your time here but um eventually when we finished i had to have just two multi-track tapes of 24 that represented all the mix downs and things so i could mix the double album and that's what we did Incredible. I w we, we did talk briefly about the musicians, Chris Spedding, obviously, and Joe uh, Partridge on guitars. We touched on Herbie Flowers. Uh, Barry Morgan was the drummer. The percussionist, Barry D'Souza, Roy Jones, and, of course, the very famous uh, Mr. Ray Cooper. Indeed. Yeah. I noticed also that you had George Fenton playing uh, yeah. Tar, Santor, and Zither. That's correct. Although there's other zither part we didn't wind up using. Oh, you didn't? I was about to say, talking of not using, I read that Santana, Santana came down to play some guitar, but he didn't end up making it on the record. Carlos Santana, that was a big loss. We had actually got to the point where not only had we uh, were ready to sign the contract with him, he came into the studio for a day to start learning and getting a feel for the role of the heat ray. Uh, which was a guitar part with its own sounds to distinguish itself. And my dad was standing outside of the studio that Carlos and I were working in. The deal that we offered all the guest artists was identical. It was fee-based, no album royalties, which was a big ask, but everybody other than Carlos agreed. They got royalties on their singles if and when they came out, but the manager he wouldn't agree. He wouldn't. He wanted more fees and royalties, and we couldn't do it because if we did it for Carlos, aside from the fact I would have needed more help from CBS, everybody would have had to be treated fairly and equally. So I lost Carlos. The next guitarist that I went to was Jeff Beck. Yeah, who's just in the last couple of weeks passed away sadly, and he was keen. And I sent him mixes of, uh, you know, to get a feel for the music, the guitar parts that Joe Partridge had demoed, the part of the heat rate. There was a, a problem with timing. He was going on tour across at least the United States, maybe other countries. And by the time uh, Jeff Beck was, in theory, getting involved, I've got all the letters of exchange and how we were going to set this up. It, it fell apart. We, we never... I never even got to meet him. At least I can say I did a day in the studio with Carlos Santana. And now that I learned of his passing, uh, it breaks me up a bit to think I had the opportunity of working with two of the great guitarists out of pop music, pop in a very loose term. Uh, they were far more than that. Not that there's anything wrong with being a brilliant pop musician or singer, but Joe took over and did a, a wonderful job. I assume it's Bill Graham. Because he Bill joined Graham. a plane crash in 91, yeah. 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 He was obviously Absolutely. very famous for the Bill Graham Presents for yeah. the whole Fillmore West, yeah. I worked with a uh, an engineer 
named Gary Lyons, who wound up, he was British and uh, wound up working with the Grateful Dead, uh, who are, I believe, managed by Bill Graham and worked with them in whatever studios they worked in. It may have been their own studios, but um, and it, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, that Bill Graham's air crash wasn't too long after Gary worked with um, with Grateful Dead. Yeah, I think he died in, in, in 91. So Partridge came up with the heat ray theme. Well, he played it. He okay. Played it. The way it worked, as it does with you know many musicians, I uh, have, say, I'm using the War of the Worlds as an example. If I've come up as a composer with a theme, I may have demoed it to give an impression of how it gets performed and and all that goes with it. Coming back to Prof, I, I would demo a tune and I would work in the studio with sounds that I would give names to just so that there's some way of identifying. So, for example, there's a riff that I composed that is now and has always been called the Wii U's. Wii U, Wii U, Wii U, and Ula, which is the expression that the Martians exclaim whether they're terrorizing the Earth or dying. I'm not necessarily, what I'm trying to say is I'm not necessarily giving them names that are based upon known instruments, traditional instruments. So with Joe, this was the heat ray theme that you, you've you asked about. And again, I had uh, a basic tune and chords, knew exactly where the heat ray theme was to go. I had all the accompaniment recorded. And Joe, Joe didn't really read music. He read chords. Oh, I see. And had fantastic feel. That, to me, was one of his great attributes. He came in on an evening, and we worked on the heat ray together. Enough of, you know, from a, the tune, the chords. And what I was trying to explain to him, that this was a weapon of the Martians, he, he just got into it. And the reason he's credited as one of the guest artists is, he wasn't known at that time, unless you knew him from session work that he was brilliant at. I was so thrilled with not just the heat ray or Ulas or anything else that he played elect with electric guitars and things, but all of the acoustic work. He played mandolin on Forever Autumn and other guitar type work. Um, and that's why he's listed there as a guest artist. Incredible. Yeah, I, I think of him uh, for session playing. I think uh, I was talking to Stuart Elliott. Of- uh, like a year ago. So, of course, uh, Steve Harley and the Cockney Rebel. Stuart Elliott, the drummer. Yes, the drummer, yeah, who was also another phenomenal session player, played with Kate Bush. And uh, what an incredible time to be involved in music in the UK, all of this kind of interchangeable, these musicians working with other incredibly talented musicians. Oh, yeah. I mean, Jimmy, Jimmy Page started his career as doing sessions. Absolutely, yeah. Jimmy, Roger, and myself were guest presenters of an award festival in Brighton. We were at the same table waiting for our turn to go up and and blather on, so to speak. But I got to know him one evening, had some pictures taken with him and all that goes with it. Um, but I didn't know until that evening that his career started sort of like Rick Wakeman, you know, who started with doing sessions, not just for me, but, you know, all around town, so to speak. But I think it was because it was also an era that, there wasn't electronics in terms of, as we're talking electronically, seeing each other by Zoom, you know, and doing sessions electronically. You know, you, you need a drum part from somebody whose work you admire. And uh, I'm here in uh, in England, and uh, that particular drummer who's got the sound and the lick that you you know is perfect for this piece you're working on, and he just happens to be living, uh, you know, abroad somewhere, anywhere around the world, and. There it is, coming down the lines electronically. It's a whole different scene. So session work was a real source of income for these wonderful musicians who then went on deservedly to become household names in their own right, either you know, as solo artists or as part of a, you know, amaz- amazing uh, bands. In the first David Essex band that I put together, he was the... the guitarist for the in the police and the andy summers andy summers yeah yes he'd been uh he'd played in the, the animals kind of later version of the animals hadn't he and he'd also played with soft machine briefly 
I think he had done like dabbled that yes as, as a session player. But I think of you you know the the guys you got on here. Barry Morgan played with uh, Blue Mink. He was a member. He was a, yeah. one of the members yeah. of Blue Mink. Yeah. Died a, a few years ago, didn't he? Now and was it two thousand seven? Uh, he and I and his family and he's got a son who became a great drummer too. Um, when they had his funeral. The last thing that we all heard was um, it was a piece of music that you could march to. And the whole idea was that he played drums on as well. I can't remember the name, but as the congregation, so to speak, almost all musicians and, and session singers or artists, we all marched out to the drumming of Barry Morgan and the, this piece of music. And it was a, a very fitting way to end service for Barry. And Barry D'Souza died a couple of years after that, and it was a very similar moving uh, moment with people that showed up. I mean, Barry's the drummer on Tumbleweed Connection. I didn't know that. Yep. And Madman Across the Water and Elton John's right. album, Elton John. Yep. Incredibly diverse musician. And that's the point, I think, of, of when you talk about, in quotes, session musicians, there was nothing derogatory about that, even though at times, oh, he's just a session musician or she's just a session singer, whatever. <laughs> no way. They were top drawer artists because they'd arrive on the sessions, rarely knowing what they had to play or to sing. And out comes gorgeous singing or funky singing, whatever was the need of the day. And, you know, the, 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 the sessions that I did, all my s scores were handwritten, and so there were parts waiting for them. But how do I know that they were going to go on the ca on the downbeat? They're going to start playing exactly what's written. Okay, you need a, a few takes. That was the norm. Yeah, we need two or three takes, and next one, please, and off we go. So I would ask you, because uh, you've said in interviews that there wasn't really any special effects as such, but there is the sound of the Martian spacecraft, which is a cylinder unscrewing recorded with two saucepans in the studio toilet. How did you do that? <laughs> okay, you, you got it mostly right. Whenever I, I said there's no sound effects, there was the BBC Sound Library that you could buy I remember it well. I still have some of that vinyl somewhere, yeah. yeah. Okay, it was the classic place to go to for sound effects. But today, in the last 20 years, sample libraries have grown. You want any, you've got it downloaded now within a minute. But in that period, in the story, the first cylinder from Mars lands on a common in Surrey called Horsel Common. And it lands in the night, and then in the morning, you start to hear it unscrew. It's a giant cylinder, so the, so its top is going to be giant in sound. And I had a couple of ideas. Firstly, nothing from the BBC, and if there was another library going, I can't remember what it was. It was nothing there that came close to what I was hearing in my head. I, I can hear the scraping of something like metallic, whatever metallic items there might be. And I was going to, it became two saucepans from our kitchen. The first attempt was using the studio toilet and trying to scrape them underwater. That didn't work. I mean, it was not even close. Uh, I tried a couple of other things before the... Uh, as I'm remembering this now, a couple of things other than the saucepans. But now, starting to run out of ideas. But I then thought that AdVision had a studio too. It was a, an overdub studio, as it would be in those days. So it was a control room with an overdub studio. So not a small studio. You, you're not, you're not a big studio, excuse me. You could probably get two or three musicians, a few singers if needed. The idea was... By now I had this bass riff, Herbie playing these notes I had written, going dun 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 and he played it on the bass guitar, and I had the tape brought downstairs to the overdub studio, and the idea was to scrape these two saucepans, but in time to the music. 
and I'm going back to rock on now. It's the same idea, a pair of uh, microphones in stereo, and I'm scraping literally like this. Now, I don't know what you can see, but I'm going round like this. The, the, the left part over here of scraping going on, and then I'm moving around. So the microphones are picking up the movement, and then I go around to the right microphone, bring it all around, and I just kept going and going. And suddenly, my engineer started understanding what we wanted. I and see. He, he started playing around with the various machines of the day and uh, you know, jacking up the amplification. And suddenly, we had this giant unscrewing of the cylinder. And whether it's on the albums, whether it's in every one of our arena tours, mixed in surround sound, it actually has scared people or certainly been enjoyed for what it sounds like. And then I get asked the question, how did you get that sound? And I tell the story and then think of a, a big balloon being burst with a needle and you hear it going, <laughs> the disappointment in a way that it wasn't this giant cylinder really unscrewing. It was me with two saucepans. <laughs> That's amazing. And the t But the toilet, in the toilet, was that just because it was the right reverberation, like a tight, you know, well, ambient sound? That's was what that... I thought. <laughs> I well, it even... works. <laughs> yeah, no, it, no, this was not successful. It didn't come close to working. That's why I wound up downstairs in this overdub just scraping the two saucepans nice so the strings you you wrote halfway a pack correct me if i'm wrong this is this is uh what what we uh, what we found out and i could be wrong the strings you wrote halfway through the production in cornwall yeah uh, it was in fact pete townsend who uh, who passed on a private house in cornwall that uh, he and his family would go to for holidays. Maybe he was writing some songs there. But it was mentioned to me that if you want solitude, it doesn't even have a telephone in it. It's got some great books. It's on overlooking a, uh, a, a lake or a bigger piece of water now, I forget. But gosh, that sounds great. I'm, I'm just going to book it. I had no idea what I was walking into. But it was beautiful coming down this very long drive. Also on the property was a hotel. So if I needed something from the hotel or they did have a telephone, at least I wasn't in some barren wilderness. When you say I'd done half of the, the, the album, I had done a project other than the strings. It was pretty much other than some final overdubs. Uh, and it was the right time to start scoring the strings. And I, I went there for it was something like four or five days and had a lot of my gear brought down by somebody who worked for us, a good friend as well in London. He drove all my gear down and set it up. He knew how I liked all my stuff to be set up. Um, and I scored all the backing tracks, the strings that wound up on the double album. And, and I probably spent about three days in total working. And uh, yeah, I was back in London four or five days later. I, I was actually, when I think back, either very, uh, I had a good sense of timing of how long things took, or I was just plain dumb because I booked, <laughs> the, I, I booked the band before I started scoring the arrangements for them to appear, appear. We did a month together from May 18th, 1976. And I was there on time. And I did the same with the strings, 40, 48 strings. Uh, and I booked those weeks in advance. And I booked Abbey Road well in advance because they're always so heavily booked. And I had no idea what I was writing until I got to Cornwall. Uh, so that's what I say. Either I just had a, a good sense of timing that I could finish all this, or I was just plain dumb. I have always leaned <laughs> <laughs> but how, wait though, just how long did it take you to do the strings in Cornwall? No more than five or six days. It was too expensive to keep hiring this out and just laying back and hey man, this is a great place to. Have so you a party. just went to work. 
You just got well, there and just gave myself a day to relax. Joe Partridge lived in another part of Cornwall. He came down on one occasion uh, just to hang out. Do you so remember I, where in Cornwall this house uh, was? I may have it in a, a diary or a book. I'm, I've been writing an autobiography that I'm catching up on because it was supposed to come out a few years ago thinking our tours were going to end, but they've kept going. So I'm waiting until at least the end of this next tour that we're doing in 2025. I do hope you come to Los Angeles. We would love to. We we were very close in 2014. We had 51 dates, 48 or 49 of them, 48 in Canada, in Montreal, and the rest across the United States. The problem we had was the band was the same band that I was working with. We felt it was too going to be too much of a problem to start with an American band. The strings were going to be from America. But the gap between finishing that amount of uh, shows and coming back and starting our booked UK tour, uh, certain dates in Europe, I'd be paying everybody. I just couldn't afford it because it was about a six week gap, you know, and if you're trying to keep people together as much as they want to do it out of love, uh, they also need to eat, put food uh, and beverage on table. And who could blame them? So we couldn't get that tour together. And, you know, I'm a New Yorker. So for me, playing at Madison Square Garden would be Incredible. a dream. I, I'd also settle for Carnegie Hall if it was big enough. Uh, it's probably other venues across New York. And, and in Los Angeles, I can think of a couple of wonderful places. Hollywood Ball. Hollywood, uh, Hollywood Ball. Ball. I was just going to yeah. say, I was offered... I say I and my team were offered to do a date. Uh, it was celebrating English talent. It was nothing to do with a tour. It was a one-off or maybe two shows at the Hollywood Bowl. And again, we couldn't afford to just do it on just a couple of, maximum a couple of shows. I can't remember now whether it was one or two, but we've been close, but as they say, close but no cigar. Well, um, if you don't come to LA, I will fly to wherever you're doing it. So. Well, I will remind you of that. Let's put it that way. No, I will. I'll do it. I'm, I'm um, going to be in England at the end of the month. I'm going to Abbey Road for five days. How are you? What are you going to do there? I'm filming a whole history on Abbey Road. Bravo. Doing it with Abbey Road, so it's going to be wonderful. And uh, I will make sure that we include the uh, string recording of uh, The War of the Worlds in there as well. We'll, we'll... I have pictures from those sessions. So if they... Ooh, oh, oh. Yeah. If it can be of any help to you, I'd be thrilled to do it. I suppose a big challenge of this must be mixing it. I mean, you've got two 24-track machines, uh, sometimes synced by the Maglink. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect description. So you mixed in sections of 30 seconds to two minutes at a time. I mean, does that mean, was it one of those sort of all hands on deck? I don't know what console you were mixing on, but I, pre I presume zero automation. So... And, and, and something, dare I say, that complex with that many tracks. Um, was it a sort of multi-handed thing where you're sitting there, people controlling yeah. mutes and volume rides and all kinds of yeah, stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Spot on. I mean, firstly, the length was dictated by the, the section of music. And when I say music, it, it could have been pure music, singing, you know, songs, and uh, with dialogue or narration. So there was just logical selections of sections because – Inevitably, it was conceptually, he's traveling across Great Britain, up and down the country, uh, the journalist. Therefore, the moods and the storylines, the invasion of the Martians, the weaponry, everything was changing wherever the story had a natural start and end to that given section. So that's what determined what section we were going to mix. But to then go on, the arrangements are very much complex in the sense of changing with the storyline. So the uh, the piece of music in question was changing as often as the storyline. So I, I just had to sort of be a bit brutal with saying to the, the, the studio team, this is what we're going to mix next. But I had a main engineer, another Jeff coincidentally, 
also from Wales. He had an assistant engineer, which uh, meant with me, we had, it was a very long desk, but no real automation. So yes, each of us had to virtually fight each other because we each had a section of the desk. Jeff, the engineer, he had more than anybody else because he was central and he was the engineer. So, he, you know, he was the boss. But we did assist in doing groups of faders in a way that we'd have to say, okay, look, on this next take, I'm going to push up whatever instrument or group of instruments or voices and explain why. And then um, our assistant engineer, Lawrence, uh, he did the same thing. And then Jeff, he had the rest of it. And it was really a lot of trial and error because there was no automation. You couldn't do it in bits and pieces and having automated it. So, okay, now all we have to do is do a little bit of repairs here or increase the levels or what, whatever the mix took to become a master take. So uh, that was the background to it. I think a lot of that's lost on people now. We're so used to even sort of like, you know, very late 70s, probably early 80s on, you know, with SSLs, you know, which I'm sitting in front of one here. You know, the fact that automation came in at that period, the fact that those days, I mean, you've got a double album, you've got two 24-track machines, um, as we said, joked about, sometimes synced by Maglink, uh, Maglink, and it's an all-hands-on-deck kind of situation. I also wanted to ask you about some of the effects you use. I know you, I've, I've read that you used uh, EMT plates, you used yeah. a, a Revox tape machine for the delays. Yeah, um, and I, I have those still here. Oh, you do? Um, yeah, and the uh, oh, I definitely want to come and visit you. <laughs> we have to come down into our cellars. I'm pretty sure it's still there. The the echo plate, I mean, it's giant, and Advision gave it to me as a present. But yeah, the the, the echo plate that is um, it's just a big heavy plate. It just if you give it in the right space, it reverberates, and attached to it was like a. Um, only one or two knobs that regulated the length of the echo. So you could shorten it, you could lengthen it. I don't think there was much else you could do with it. I think you could do more effects, but back at the desk where you had more more options. Incredible. And you must have everything synced because you're only working in 30 seconds to two minutes. You're syncing with the MagLink. Was it, was it using SIMPT? to sync the two machines? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then that would also be synced to the two track with SMPTE as well so that you could work on sections and punch no, no, in. No, 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 it, the mix down went to one two track machine. The multi, uh, the mag link is what linked the two 24 tracks together. Absolutely, and I was just thinking about though uh, when you're punching in or were you doing, uh, just doing like 30 second pieces and then couple of seconds doing another 30 seconds to two minutes and then yeah. later splicing all of that together. Absolutely. Sorry, oh, yeah. I see. You're, no, that's spot on. Oh, but. okay. So you weren't, you weren't syncing the two track to the 24s as well. So that you, you every time you're punching in, you're punching to the same section. Not you're not actually, mean. I see. That's what I was trying to ascertain. Yeah. That's a, that's a heck of a lot of work. How long did the mixing process take? Well, as best as I can remember without, I do have it, because of this, my book, I do have that information in more precision terms. It came out Father's Day, June 9th or whatever, 1978. And the mixing started about a year earlier, around the beginning of 77. Wow. I came back and forth because of the Airplay album, for example. Uh, any singles that I wanted to add, any bits that made... Because it was continuous play, the double album, there was no natural introductions and endings to the songs or the themes that became singles. So I had to create those and then edit them onto the main section that we had mixed. So there were all sorts of reasons, uh, I think, waiting for Julie Covington to come in to do her part. So the reasons, when so when we called the mixing period, it did include things that were other than pure mixing. What, a, what an undertaking. <laughs> what an absolute oh. undertaking. 
Who knew? Who knew? What a spot I was is all I can think. <laughs> well, I think I think now we're so spoiled with um, you know, I mean, we've been spoiled since the the, the you know most of the eighties and, and beyond with with SSLs and and that ability. But even then, now in the world of DAWs, um, you want to copy and paste something, it's highlight, boom, done. <laughs> you want to automate something, you can just go in there and draw it in in a matter of seconds. Um, but I wonder, you know, with the way records are made now, with the, re- the way the records were made then, do you feel like some of that randomness is the wrong word? That that the fact that you're it's it, it's more organic in approach and more difficult, and you have to commit to stuff. Um, do you think that that actually increases the creativity? What in today's terms? No, in in those terms, the fact that you you were always pushing up against barriers. So you had to be a little bit more creative in a sense rather than nowadays uh, things are so easy, but I don't know if anything's more creative as a result. I feel like the challenges push us to be more creative. Uh, I think there is great creativity around, but it's a different type of creativity. In the year, I mean, and I work in, in today's world, not in the same way I've worked 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and going back even more so. I mean, I'm of an age that I'm trained to do orchestrations, which to this day, when it comes to string writing particularly, I don't work at an instrument. I'll just sit here at my desk. What I'm hearing goes down to paper. Everything else I am doing electronically. But I think the creative ideas come from what move you. And I think no matter what era comes along, has come along, uh, it starts with the musician, the creator, the producer. I mean, let's look at Mozart and all the great classical composers. They didn't even have electricity, you know, and they did come up with some nice tunes. You know, and- <laughs> Just a couple. I, I, I love that quote, talking of Mozart, it's just, I don't know if he said it or somebody said it about him, just saying that, you know, all music is improvised. Well, I don't know who said it, but that's a damn good quote. Yeah. So whether whether you're sitting in front of a DAW or just a sheet of manuscript, there's there's some it, it has to come from somewhere. It's just the capture, the moment of capture. I think has has changed so dramatically. And that's a good way of call uh, of calling it. And I I know in today's world, in my own way, I'm as fast as say a young guy, young lady coming around, and has just grown up with the world of electronics, and they do move and fast and furious but i actually now look at my productions and i'm pretty fast i you know i probably need at least one person who works with me which may be the 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 person of today works on their own in their own little studio i've never been unemployed long enough to teach myself how to do certain electronic things so i've been blessed by having a career but i picked up enough to work electronically and the the more for me, the more complex stuff. I have somebody. Well, I'm known as the guy on the left to my engineer programmer, and he's known to me as the guy on the right. And <laughs> that's it. That's our team. I read that the the mix for vinyl side four was destroyed. Yep. So how? What's the story behind that? The you know I mentioned uh, the associate engineer that worked with us in the mixing stage. His name was Lawrence. His, his name is Lawrence. And when we were mixing, we had another engineer in the back room capturing all the stereo mixes. And it was quite traditional, nothing unique in, on our part, uh, that had the, the takes that sounded great, I would say keep. And anything that we knew was not even close, there was an outtake reel that at the end of the day session, those outtake reels with a razor blade on a quarter inch tape, you know, width on a 10 inch spool deliberately got spliced down the middle and all the, the bits of tape got chucked away in a bin. So all we had left was truly excellent takes, not necessarily the masters. That was for the listening backstage. And I was making notes along the way. So I knew in theory I had everything I wanted. So we finally, finally get to the last day of mixing. We complete it. It's the end of the session. Suddenly, all this time, 
all the time that you know the a very small team in this in the studio had lived and breathed martian we had said goodbye to our performers in every form and it was just the three of us so we got a bottle of champagne in drunk ourselves sick and parted company the next morning i i had an office building literally around the corner from where i lived in london uh, whatever time i woke up i go into my i walk to my my office and a call comes through it's roger the studio manager that i'd mentioned and uh, he asked to speak to me so i was in whatever room i was in and i was told jeff is roger roger cameron he's on the phone and he just wants to have a word with you sure okay so um i thought he was going to say jeff congratulations you are done we are thrilled with as the studio and proud to have been involved with you but his his opening line was jeff are you standing up which i happened to be so i said yeah i'm standing up just by a, a desk in one of the offices he says sit down why he said well i've just got to explain something to you the first first thing that came to my head was that Jeff, our engineer, or Lawrence, or Declan, uh, a lovely guy uh, from Ireland, who was the the man in question that, that he was coming to speak to about? I mean, said, "Look, I'm not quite sure how to explain it, but I'm just going to just come out with it." I don't know. I, I, I that's that's right. I said, "Is somebody dead, injured, whatever?" No, no, no. But the way that I can only explain it to you is this: Deck, as he was known, uh, cut through. The wrong reel of tape. It wasn't the outtakes of side four. It was the master tape. And believe it or not, and the only reason I'm calling you at this time is that we, first of all, looked everywhere in the studio, and it was a big studio complex. And then we saw the garbage men, trash men, whatever rubbish men, whatever we're calling it, uh, driving away with one of these big rubbish trucks. And we thought, well, it's got to be in there. And stupidly, how could we believe that with all the refuse that they'd been collecting, we're going to find two zillion pieces of, you know, a quarter an inch of tape or whatever the, you know, the spliced version represented. But we did, and we followed it to wherever it was all being unloaded. And we searched and we searched and we realized we're total schmucks. We can't possibly get to find the outtake tapes. And even if we did, how are we going to join them all? You know, reality struck in. He said, so that is that is the reality. We can't put them together even if we found it. So we're just going to offer you, uh, it was, I was averaging about a week per side. He said, you know, if it takes a week, if it takes two, whatever, the studio is yours for free. Can you come back, say, from tomorrow on? And I started laughing. I always remember this because I think it was the release that nobody was injured, nobody was ill. Maybe we'll even do better takes. Um, and we did, actually, I think. And that's how Side 4, the Master Side 4, came about. It was the wrong tape that got spliced up. We did it again. Wow. Well, you got out of it. And I would never have known until I read that story. I mean, Side Four's a masterpiece. So, hey. Because there's that famous story, I don't know how true it is, but there's that famous story of Eno threatening to destroy um, the mix or the recording, I think, of Within Without You or something. Like, I, I can't remember. The point was is they he felt like they were laboring on something for so long that it might have just been easier to go and re-record it with all the information they had learned from the process. So I suppose my question to you is, when you came back to remix side four again with that week, did you feel like you had tons of acquired knowledge and you took it even further? Or were you chasing your tail just like, how can I, we get it back? If I had acquired knowledge, I wouldn't have spent all the time trying to put this project together. That's the story. <laughs> no, it ain't that one. But <laughs> what I do remember is we were in good spirits. Roger must have passed on to Jeff and the team but I didn't take it badly at all. In fact, I, I did have a good laugh. Okay, we've lost time, but time is is priceless, is, is priceless in the sense that if you have the time, 
whatever it takes, it takes. And I was pretty loose about it. So I know that we did finish it. It was the right tape that got sliced up as the outtakes and the right tape that became the master side four. And uh, that was it. It was done. Do you remember the the premiere? Because oh, it was June the 1st at the, uh, at the London Planetarium. I do. And I remember it intimately because by the time it was launched, Columbia in the United States passed on it. CBS UK picked it up and said, we're, we're going to give it everything it deserves. We don't know if it's going to sell, uh, whether it's the album, the double album or the singles, whatever, but we're going to make sure the UK media, and there were a few from other countries, if I remember correctly, like Holland and Germany that came over, but it was almost entirely British press and media. And it was at the London Planetarium. And about two, three weeks before the actual launch, we were allowed in when the planetarium closed for the night with their general public. And we set up, you know, for its day, a pretty, I think, interesting launch. I, I was in the back uh, working uh, with both our engineer and uh, uh, an, an engineer whose job was to work with lighting and smoke uh, and a few other effects of the day. Uh, it was all timed as precision timing allowed for that day in, in time. And I was scared shitless because now I'm facing, along with our record company, all the, you know, from the chairman through to key people, they gave me the support. They were there. And my, my dad, Doreen, most of the guest artists, we knew that, you know, it was going to be either shit or bust. When it came to the end of the first half, there was snacks, drinks, but only like 15 minute break type of thing. And then everybody came back. I stayed behind with the engineers talking how we're getting ready for the second act. And because it was in the London planetarium, everything was up above as planetariums tend to be. So our spotlights, our smoke, all the things that we were using, multiple speakers, but nothing that you reflect in today's world, surround sound, you know, multi, 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 multi speaker sound. And then when it came to the end, there was a, a, a bit of stunned silence. It was like it, it was over, but nobody knew quite what to do until our, the then chairman of CBS stood up and said, thank you for coming. We hope you feel about it as we did. And there was suddenly applause and cheers. And mm -hmm. it, it was because I didn't know what to expect. I really did not know. Nobody in my team, uh, family or any of the, the, the guest artists, the the band that were there, anybody who came that had spent this long period with with me, we had no idea. Uh, and to hear this reaction from real hardened media people who were not being polite, they were res responding, you know, in a in a way that um, I wish I had put a suit on or something, but I was in just jeans, my normal sort of way, operating the bits that I had to. I never thought about, well, what's going to happen after this is over? But then there was a real party in the main entrance to the planetarium room itself. When I say a party, it's because pretty much everybody wanted to stay and chat and talk about it, ask me questions, ask all the others. So very memorable moment in my career and life. But who knew, really, who knew what was going to happen? I mean, it's a fully immersive experience. I mean, for that period of time, it was what immersive was um, with that beautiful artwork from the album cover to obviously Richard Burton, all these incredible musicians, incredible singers, everything about it, I suppose. And it spun off what there's been obviously multiple live performances with you touring it, video games, uh, remix. I know in 2005, is it uh, Gary Langan did um, The Surround? Maybe I'm unaware. Is there an immersive version? What you're quoting is one of the DVDs. We mix it studios in surround sound. Yeah. And you just asked the immersive experience. Yes. Now, as we have become familiar, and it's, it's an expanding industry without question, I was approached by a company that had launched one of the very first uh, immersive experiences 
a small, it was a proof of concept, pretty small, short show, but it was brilliant. And it convinced me and others within my team that the War of the Worlds could work as an immersive experience. And it was booked for three months in Leadenhall Street at what was originally the old metal exchange. It's, it's about a five minute walk from the Shard, if that means, sort of gives you an idea. It's uh, one big building over uh, a few floors designed deliberately to throw you off your equilibrium a bit. So you're going up, you're going down. Uh, it's only 12 people per room, uh, per, per scene, 21 scenes, and people are coming in uh, sort of like on a rolling concept. So was, if we have all 12 seats sold on a given day, when that scene is finished, you move to the next room, and then the next lot of 12 people are allowed in, and it just keeps rolling from the first show of the day, which is around midday right to the last show at night which is around between 10 and 11 with the exception of the period that of lockdown here in the uk because of covid uh, albeit we didn't know at the time of covid coming because it was going to be booked for three months well a couple of months ago it passed its fourth year and it's been quite an amazing success you know four years for something that was booked for three months that's not bad and it's it's going to go it seems to the it's already extended to next September. Our lease on the building expires the following June. So we've got a year from this June. Uh, and now we're talking about trying to move it into London and or other sort of versions of it. Uh, but it's quite a, a success that we never anticipated. It's all set to my score, but designed with all the technologies that you can imagine. And if you looked on TripAdvisor, it's in the highest part of its charts week after week. We're one of the entertainments that has had the most five-star ratings for what that's worth, thrilled with the success. And it's already passed, long past all the loyal fans to the War of the Worlds it's beginning and to the shows and all the other things in between. So um, again, it's sort of like the double album. We're like our arena tours. We had no idea if anybody was going to show up until, oh yeah, there's some tickets selling. Oh, it's sold out that venue. It's good. Yeah. It's, Amazing. It's happening. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very much. Jeff, this has been incredible. It's uh, a dream come true to talk to you about this and to go into such in amazing detail. I really, really and appreciate it. I don't have it. any notes here, so my, some of it must have logged in my brain at some point. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would hope so. Well, it took it took many years of your life, I mean, and uh, and still such a huge part of what you do, obviously, yeah, um, it is. It is. for obvious reasons. It's an absolute masterpiece, and uh, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you about it. You're a rock star. Thank you ever so much. Well, I really appreciate it. And thank you to the man not on camera, Yes, the real, the real, the real power, the real man with the power, Eric, Eric over there. Yes. No problem. Warren, thank you so much. I don't know if Eric's going to be with you in the UK, but uh, please thank him for today, and uh, see you soon. All right. Thanks ever so much, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. And all the best. Please thank your wife for her patience. <laughs> and apologize. Cold, but I, I expect the food to be cold. She doesn't give me. Uh, do overs, you know, with the hot meal. So there you go. It was well worth it, though. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. I really appreciate it. All the best and to you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye.